I'd like to share with you post-processing indirect bonding trays. You know, it's a very important part of being able to produce the most accurate indirect bonding trays, and sometimes there's a little bit of confusion over it. And it really starts even from removing trays from the build platform. You'll notice that I printed these horizontally without supports. You can print on supports if you'd like, but we have found that we have really great success being able just to print without supports. Now, we like a beveled spatula that will allow us to reach underneath and peel the tray off without distorting. You'll notice that these trays are clear. Uh, we found that 100 microns is accurate enough, but 50 microns tends to produce a clear tray regardless of what um, material or what printer we're using. And you'll see that 50 microns is going to allow the light to transmit through uh, better than 100 microns. The 100 microns when we tested it tended to absorb more of the light uh, than the 50 microns during our bonding process. Now we like to use 99% IPA, but we're going to keep it separate. I like to keep the resin, um, the IPA that's going to be used for the resin separate than what's going to be done for indirect bonding. Because remember, the indirect bond material is really approved for interoral use, so there's a biocompatibility there, where your resins that you're using for your model probably aren't. You're also going to have several containers. We like to label them IDB1 and IDB2, because soon as the tray is removed from the build platform, you're going to place it in the first one because you're going to find that that resin is really viscous and there's going to be a lot that you need to remove. So we're going to start and put it in number one. We're then going to put that container onto an orbital shaker. Whatever system you use to agitate your models will work as well. We like the orbital shaker and then we use these rubber made containers that are basically made for your lunch um, and they're really leak proof. So it's really um, nice to contain that, that alcohol for us. We're going to leave it on about three to four minutes. And then when we remove it, what we want to do is forcibly blow air uh, to remove that alcohol and the resin that's now suspended in that alcohol. And you really want to get into the black bracket wells. Because here's the thing, if you leave resin in the well and then it becomes cured, when you go to slide the bracket in, it's just not going to fit. And I want to blow those until they appear to be dry. At this point, you're done yet, um, you're going to put it into IBD2. Now, when we set up our indirect bonding um, system, we needed a compressor, and I didn't really want a line from my main compressor, so we just used the California Air Tool compressor. They're really quiet. Um, bought it at a local hardware store, and then we also attached a gun to it um, and used the the, the needle that you'd use to blow up like basketballs or bike tires because here's the thing it's really thin so you can really get it down inside the well um, you can use your dental compressor and your dental syringe but this is really a good alternative as well. now once you've blown that dry the first time you now have to stick it into the IDB2 and you want to make sure that this is really clear uh, you don't want to use any contaminated um, IPA Put it back on your orbital shaker for three to four minutes. And now you're going to take it off and blow it again. Now this time, if you take a look at the tray, if it feels sticky or it looks shiny, particularly look down in the wells. If it looks shiny, go ahead and stick it back in and repeat that, um, that, uh, that agitation again because you may have extra resin still sitting in those wells. And that's where people really struggle because if you go ahead and start curing it, you're going to end up with an inaccurate, inaccurate well. Here's where everybody has a little bit of a preference. The amount of time that you cure that tray will determine how rigid or how flexible your tray is. So what I always recommend, the first couple trays you print, print multiple of the same tray and then cure them for different times and then see which one you like the feel of as you're seating your brackets and you like the feel in the patient's mouth because we're all going to be a little bit different there. The longer you cure it, the more rigid it will become. For us, if we're using our Envision Tech Rapid Cure, we're going to go 500 flashes. So that compares to when we're doing a model, we'll go 1,000 on each side. So you see it's about 25% of the cure time that you might be using on a model. If we go into our Cure Box Plus, we're going to leave it in for about 5 to 6 minutes. Now when you're done with the cure process, if it feels tacky or um, looks shiny, go back and rewash it because you, you have some uncured resin there. Once you're finished curing, I recommend putting in a light tight box. If you just let it sit out on the counter, 
uh, the ambient light will continue to cure that and they'll get more rigid over time. You know, we first really discovered this when we were using them in our um, TC rooms and I started playing with one and I could snap it. And I'm like, well, where did that come from? And it was just being exposed to light over a period of time. So it's not like it's going to happen overnight. Um, but if you really like the feel that you have, as soon as you cure them, get in the habit of just putting them in the box. We'll label the patient's name and then they'll go to the lab to be stored until the patient arrives. Now what about loading trays? If you're using a non-pasted bracket, I would go ahead and load them right when you're done post-processing them. You put them in the box and then you're ready for the patient. All you're gonna need to apply your paste before the patient arrives. If you're using a pre-coated bracket, like a flash-free bracket, which works really well with this, with this system, what I would do is we load them about a day before. We don't want to do it too far ahead of time. For some reason, if the patient is delayed, uh, isn't coming in when we anticipated, we can always remove those brackets. Now remember, they're still clean. We haven't used them. We haven't touched anybody with them. So you could use them in another tray. Um, you could put them back in and use them later. The important part is to, once you get those trays loaded, put them back in the box. Now, sometimes people are concerned if I'm using a flash-free bracket, how much time do I have? You have enough time to load the tray. We don't use it in bright lights, but just in our average lab light, um, we've got enough working time that we can go ahead, seat the brackets, and then put them back into that box. Now, one of the things I recommend is having the same person load all of your trays. One, they get much quicker, they're very accurate, and there's a consistency in how the tray is seated. And they're gonna be able to determine if there's maybe some inconsistencies maybe in the printing or your tray design because they're the one that are doing it every day. I think where people really set themselves up for failures is that they have like all the chair side people doing it. They're doing chair, they're doing it at the chair. Um, and there's that inconsistencies. I, I know myself, I was always putting brackets in upside down. Um, so have one person designated to do it and you'll be surprised um, how much quicker you'll get through the learning curve. You know, if you want to delegate it to more later, but particularly in the beginning, start with one person. The other thing that we do in our lab is for the max layer arch, if you invert the brackets, it's an easier process because remember you're putting those in that tray upside down um, and that seems to really help. We also like to mark the midline and we found an effective way to mark the midline is to use a baker's pen, which is really just a, a food color pen that bakers use when they're making cookies and, and cakes. The nice thing is too, you can also wipe off that tip if you need to. Now, when you're working with a flash-free bracket, you want to be careful. You just want to touch the edge. You don't really want to grab it in the middle and then to be able to slide it into the well. You can see how it'll fit snugly into that well. And again, you do have enough time to insert all of them and then put it away. One thing we'll do after we seat all the brackets is then invert the tray upside down and gently shake it to make sure all the brackets stay in place. If you have a, a good tray design and you've really followed some good post-processing practices, you should be able to invert that tray, lightly shake it, and the bracket should stay in place for you. Then after their trays are loaded, put them back into that light tight case, and that's how we're gonna take it to the patient chair side. So we'll take a look at the bonding process itself. Obviously we like to isolate. Um, we'll just use a tongue guard. We don't use, need to use the um, suction part of the NOLA. We're gonna put that tongue guard in and then we're gonna remove it when we go to seat the tray. This is more just gives the patient something to rest on. We like to etch both the maxillary and the mandibular arch at the same time. And we're gonna put the gel just where the bracket is going to be positioned. They'll follow the similar technique you did when you did um, direct bonding. So if you etched for 10 to 15 seconds, that's exactly what you're going to do. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna rinse and we're gonna lightly dry. And then they're gonna go ahead and apply self-etching primer to the conditioned surfaces. And then make sure you blow that nice and thin and make sure you're not getting too much self-etching primer in approximately. Sometimes when people tell me, how come my trays get stuck in approximal? What's happened is that they've blown that out. They've blown it in approximal and now they've actually bonded the tray to the, to the teeth itself in approximately. We've etched both arches, but just go ahead and use your self-etching primer on one arch and they like to start the lower. When they're doing the self-etching, before they put that self-etching primer and you'll notice they've taken that tongue guard out, 
uh, and that way it's easier for me to slide the tray. You've got that midline mark. You're going to line up the midline, seat the posterior, and then to the anterior. Seated in place, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do a tack cure to hold that in position. And then my staff will go ahead and do a final cure. Now you'll see that you can see part of the bracket from underneath because when, when you look at that tray design we're using, we don't completely cover the bracket. You can see the gingival wing. So I recommend that we'll tack cure from underneath and then the staff will go and then go interproximal. Once that lower tray is completed, you can either remove the tray or often my staff will just leave that tray there because it helps kind of hold the tongue back and keep any saliva down out of the way. Now they're going to repeat the procedure on the top. But remember, you've already etched the top. So now what you're going to do is go ahead and you're going to apply that SEP, blow it into a thin layer. And I, I recommend blowing toward the incisal edge, not interproximal, again, so you don't have that issue with the tray. I'm going to seat the maxillary tray, and then I'm going to continue with that cure. And what you'll notice is where the tray stops, you're still going to see the gingival bracket. So it's just above the slot. Um, that way it's enough to keep the bracket in place, but also gives us access. And it allows me to be able to make sure too that those brackets are staying secured um, as I'm seating that tray. One thing you'll notice when you're curing, how the light will travel through that tray and you'll see as it will disperse throughout the tray into adjacent teeth. 15 micron printed layer um, trays tend to do this more, but some of the light is going to be absorbed. What I recommend is once you print some trays, go ahead and put them on a light meter, shine your light through and see how much is passing through. Thicker trays obviously absorb more than thinner trays. And also check the intensity of your light. Um, we use a light that has a turbo on it um, that when we're in direct bonding, we can boost that up so that even though some of the um, the light is absorbed by the tray, there's still enough penetrating the tray to cure the bracket. Also think about tip size. Some of the curing lights have a larger tip and the angle of the tip makes it hard to get uh, to the posterior. So we have a, a five millimeter tip that we can pop onto our curing light and the angle of it really makes it easier to get into the posterior. When you look at tray design, you're going to want to be able to see some of the bracket. One, it makes it easier to cure. It also makes sure that uh, when you're sliding your brackets in, you can see that they're completely seated. It also makes sure when I'm seating the tray that I can visualize my brackets. And it also makes it much easier to remove once you're uh, done with your final. So there's different ways you can take this off. Most of my staff likes to use their fingers or if I'm removing them, I'll reach on the in the inside in the post here and peel it off um, the lingual surface from the back and then to the front. Or sometimes we'll use a scaler if we need to um, for access to be able to get in and just go from the lingual, go to the back, lift it up, and then you'll be able to lift it off the anterior teeth. Really um, once that tray is removed, we'll then go ahead and do a final cure. Here we have an example of a case that we use flash-free brackets to indirect bond. And you'll notice, obviously, there isn't any flash, um, which makes it very nice. If you're going to be uh, adding your own adhesive, you're going to have to play around a little bit to see exactly how much adhesive you want. And I really recommend using a uh, a low viscosity nano filled resin so that you can use a really thin layer but still get a high bond strength. Now people will ask me how much time will I save chair side? Well if you know how long it takes you to direct bond divide that in half. You know some people are just naturally quicker if it takes you an hour to go in to go direct it's going to do half hour indirect. So you can even judge with your with your own team members how that's going to work. But what you'll find is patients like it because one, it is so much quicker for them. And two, it really creates a consistency in bracket positioning, particularly in offices where maybe there's multi-doctors or if it's a, a task that doctors tend to delegate. It's really going to increase your efficiency even just really through the consistency. So I, I hope you found some pointers on post-processing because it can be something that people tend to get hung up on. They get so excited that they've, they've got their tray design, they've got the tray printed, and then they get really disappointed if the brackets aren't fitting. And 
you know, a lot of times it's the post-processing is where people are, are struggling. So I hope you found this useful and, and have fun as you indirect bond. Thank you.